Take me back to the genesis of this. What initiated this mission all the way to Antarctica? As I looked at what we were doing in the north, and in particular what we were seeing our adversaries doing in the north, um, we realized that you know it's we can see climate change in the north. We can see what what China and Russia have been doing in and around the Canadian North. I wonder what's going on in the South Pole, and we get the perspective and experience of the South American navies that are down here all of the time. And so the genesis of this was the idea of let's let's go get some hands-on experience. Let's have this deployment serve as a forcing function for us to get closer to the navies of South America that work in this polar region. Let's do some science and just see if we can figure out things that can help us better protect and defend our own north. Do you think there's a security concern here in Antarctica as there is in the Arctic? I definitely do. I am concerned that we, the, you know, the whole agreement that we would not militarize the Arctic, that we would not exploit the resources of the, of the Antarctic, sorry, would, uh, could change. And I don't think that's in our interest to allow that to change easily. What have you learned? Because you said it was your goal to find out what China's doing. So what have you found out? So I did not realize that the Russians had a base down here that was right beside the Chileans and where exactly it was. And so just by the simple fact of coming down here and appreciating how closely we all, I mean, all of these different operations are. And in the research in advance of coming down here, we realized that China is increasing their Antarctic footprint. Um, and what for us, we really want to do is understand is it the same type of scientific research that they're doing down here that we've seen them doing? A lot of their research is dual purpose. It obviously serves a military purpose as well as an economic and potentially a diplomatic purpose. So it's interesting to get a better sense of that. And how would that impact Canada? I mean, we all know the world is a bit crazy right now. It's uh, disordered, you might say. So how would knowing what China or Russia is doing in Antarctica affect Canadians? So it's always easy from a military point of view to understand the capabilities of another nation in terms of the military. We can look at how many tanks they have, how many ships do they have, how many aircraft do they have. What's always harder to discern is intent. Countries will always say positive things, they always talk. In fact, I've seen speeches by a Chinese defense minister that could have been given by our minister because the language is the same. But the interpretation and meaning of the words can often be different. And so coming down here, seeing what they're doing gives us a better understanding of their intent. So what do you think their intent is? I don't know. I think Russia's made their intent pretty clear, right? So we've seen an increase in Russian capability in the Arctic. We've seen an illegal and unprovoked invasion in Ukraine. There's no doubt in my mind about Russia's intent. Um, but I think China is, is something where there's some concerning indicators with how they've uh, treated some of our aircraft when we've operated, some of the responses to, to our operations in the South China Sea. But on another level, I don't know that they're operating that differently from how we would operate if a Chinese task group came into Canadian waters. We would still go out with our ships and our aircraft to monitor what they were doing, just as they monitor what we do in their waters. How would you compare the security and sovereignty concerns in the Arctic com compared with Antarctic? The biggest difference is the Antarctic Treaty. Right? So there's a the whole idea that the countries of the world will cooperate and that there's no advantage to be gained by any country, whereas the Arctic, Really, all of the areas are delineated already. There's uh, still some work to be done with some specific cl claims and uh, continental shelf extensions to be re re resolved through the UNCLOS process. But I think the biggest difference is the fact that there is a competition already in the Arctic. We know that the resources uh, in the Arctic can be challenged. And you know, what we need to do as Canada is continue to do what we've done, which is build the capacity to make sure we can understand everything that's happening in our Arctic and respond to make sure that our interests are protected. Commander, you've talked about an understaffed Navy. You've talked about old ships with long lives and a lack of modern ships. How do you defend an expenditure like this to come thousands of kilometers down south from Canada and explore this part of the world? Yeah, it's quite simple. Um, navies of the world, have, we've seen the greatest increase in human prosperity since the Second World War because of peace that's been maintained at sea, freedom of shipping around the world and in a, in a desire to not have any choke points be stopped by different things, whether it's piracy off the coast of Somalia, the actions of the Houthis in the Red Sea, and things like that. South American navies are a part of that solution as well. And so this ship, uh, Margaret Brook, is visiting just about every South American country on their way around, working with all of the key navies of the region um, to build partnerships and relationships. Canada shares a dark vessel detection uh, system with uh, Colombia and um, Ecuador. Right, which helps them protect their sovereignty and security. So we have an interest in this region because if, if things are safe and secure here, it's to the benefit of everyone. And so I think a, this is a relatively small investment in the shared burden of continuing to make sure that the seas are free and open for all. 
What about this collaboration with scientists? They're all down there on the quarter deck working away, hoping that they get another chance to do something like this with a vessel like this and the support they've had. Will this kind of co-pro continue? I think this is the type of thing that'd be worth doing every three to five years or so to come down, you know, visit South America, visit Antarctica to continue to further the research. But honestly, we need to make sure that the, you know, the governments and organizations that these scientists come from, if they found value in this and Canada continues to think it's a worthwhile thing to do, then yeah, we should definitely do it again. But like all of the activities we do, we need to make sure we evaluate the benefits afterwards. Was it really worth the expense and effort of this? My feeling right now from having talked to the scientists and seen the crew on board and the knowledge that we've gained, I think it is worthwhile. What about the crew? The crew seems pretty excited and happy. I mean, this ship has been uh, north of the Arctic Circle. It's crossed the equator, and next week it's going to go south of the Antarctic Circle. There's not a lot of ships that have done that um, in the world, and the fact that the Canadian Navy will have done it in one ship in one year is a pretty incredible achievement. I heard you talk about this as a global navy. Yeah. Uh, some people wonder, how can we be a global navy? We're too small. We can barely keep our frigates afloat you know, now. We can't expand. China's making ships every moment we speak. They're the largest navy ship-wise in the world now. How can we keep compete? Well, I'd love to have shipyards like China has. In fact, I would, but Korea's yards would be fantastic. So we're building the fleet that we need right now with the commitment from the government to 15 river-class destroyers, the potential acquisition of 12 uh, you know, submarines. We've got the six ships in this class. We've got two tankers coming as well. So we are building the fleet that we require. But in the meantime, the Halifax class, despite its age, continues to be deployed around the world. Uh, HMCS Ottawa is on its way back, it's just reached Pearl Harbor at the end of a six-month deployment in Indo-Pacific. Shortly, Ville de Quebec is going to be joining uh, a British task group and deploying into the Indo-Pacific again. We've got a, another couple of Canadian ships headed to Europe as part of OP Reassurance later this year. So yeah, we might be a small navy, but we really are, have got global reach. Um, in fact, HMCS Montreal last year did around the world circumnavigation as part of its Indo-Pacific deployment. Do you feel like the investment is behind you in Canada? Yes, I definitely do right now, and there's more we could be do. I'd love to see more money spent on the operations and maintenance budgets and infrastructure in the department, but those commitments are there, and that money is coming. And we're heading into another Canadian election. What are you going to ask of the new government? Um, what I, my preference is that we avoid ele election promises around defense, because those tend to be negative promises. Um, but uh, no, I think no matter what government is elected, there's a pretty clear commitment by Canada that we need to spend more on defense and security. Um, because the world is a dangerous place and the oceans around Canada only protect them with a powerful navy to make sure that we can keep those waters ourselves.